Näin ikkunasta, kun Through the window, I could see Kola and Turo walking to the cottage. Turo in front, ramrod straight, looking very stern. Kola behind, looking down, beaten. They came in. Kola stood back, looking away. Turo walked right up to me, took my shoulder and said, Yuri is dead. Is everything ready? I was waiting for you. I thought I was late. It's already getting cold. What a lovely sky. I love that red. Yuri was a very well-adjusted and calm person, an easy child, you could say. He was a very inquisitive and creative child. He kept an imaginary fox in the cellar, who was his best friend. All his life, Yuri made friends very easily. Whenever he ran into challenges, he always managed to cope. Everyone came to a meeting. Around 10 minutes before it ended, a press conference was held. We learned that teachers and foreign observers were involved, and that the convoy was carrying food and medicine for indigenous Trike people in the village, where the situation had become dangerous. <laughs> The situation was explained to us. The village had declared its autonomy and been cut off. Paramilitary troops had surrounded it. The situation seemed calm, but we were warned that the area was dangerous. It was a gamble to go to San Juan Copala. The road in the village of La Sabana curves. The people in the houses lining the road stared at us. The atmosphere was weirdly ominous.
At the next curve, we suddenly heard a loud noise. My colleague said, someone's shooting at us. At that moment, I still didn't believe that someone could be attacking us. But then I saw the armed men approaching us from over a nearby hill. I heard someone shout behind us, watch out, they're armed. I was terrified. I turned around and saw men pointing assault rifles at us. The bullets started raining down on the car windows and one of them shattered. At that point, all I could think about was how to survive. Like the others, Yuri was acting on the assumption that a humanitarian aid convoy wouldn't be attacked. The plan had been that if they ran into any problem, the convoy would turn around immediately. Yuri was on my right. Our first reaction was to dive to the floor of the car. I wasn't even thinking about the best course of action. We just followed our survival instincts and started running from the attackers. Then we heard shouting. I saw blood. I realized that Betty had been hit. And Yiri, Yiri got up to get closer to Betty to try and help. And that was when Yiri was shot in the head. It was right around here. We were doing some forest work. And then suddenly the phone rang. I was a bit confused, wondering who could be calling me. First the caller spoke Swedish, then English. She asked, are you Kola Jakula? I answered yes. She kept asking if I could sit down. She said she had terrible news and that I should try to stay calm and please sit down. So I sat down, right about here, I guess. She said that Yuri had been on a convoy to San Juan Copala and the convoy had been attacked. Yuri was dead or seriously injured. It was so shocking, so awful. I'll never forget it. No one should have to go through this. At first, the pain that Yuri was gone was actually physical. 
Now it's all turned into something else. It's no longer all-consuming, but it's still there. Yuri's life ended far too soon. We've come here mainly to meet other organizations staging protests. Hopefully we can inspire people to take action wherever it's needed to build a just and democratic world. You can tell from his school photos that he had a rebellious spirit. He grew from an open, baby-faced kid into a sort of threatening-looking punk. Spiky hair standing straight up in some pictures. At one point he dyed it black. Even at that age, Yuri took an interest in social issues. But he didn't get involved in direct action until he moved to Turku after finishing his civil service. He made new friends there, kindred spirits, young people who were looking for an alternative, a better way of life. They were into nature conservation and human rights and so on. He began to question everything and to think about what can be done to change the world. I had such a close relationship with Yuri that there was a bond between us, even if we weren't always in touch, even though he had his own life, which I didn't know anything about. He got it into his head that he should go and support these people working for human rights and indigenous people in Mexico. He knew the work would be dangerous, but that didn't deter him. The situation in the region was quite complicated. For years, people have been profiting off the back of the region where the indigenous Trike people lived. Several regional administrations had been siphoning off enormous sums of government money. The indigenous people never saw any of it. It never went to the poor people who needed it. The money is not being used for construction or education, which is what it's earmarked for. It's being used to prop up the power structure. The money is spent on weapons and bullets. People are being killed in ambushes every day. Factions are fighting over power, land, space, influence. I think the convoy was attacked because we went into the area, even though we were warned not to. We were attacked because we posed a threat to their power.
Juri joutu rooliin jo tähän ei ihan Juri found himself in a situation he couldn't fully understand. He knew about the conflicts in Oaxaca and he'd read up on the situation in San Juan Copala, but he wouldn't have been able to assess the security situation, the likelihood of an attack. Hyökkäyksen todennäköisyyttä. It was a journey of discovery. I went there to learn about how popular movements work, about approaches to revolutionary organization, about how these things are done. I wanted to find out about alternative ideas, see what projects people were working on, what kind of vision they had for a better society, and even how they already achieved their goals. Yuri and I worked on a few projects together. An event was organized in the Oaxaca city center to discuss the opportunities afforded by renewable energy, how to generate power by pedaling a bike and what solar power can do. We also made a video there. My name is Yuri Yakola and I'm from a Finnish organization. Yuri said pretty directly that he was also here to serve as a so-called human shield. Whenever there were nationals from Western states involved, it seemed to raise the game. It made it all a much bigger deal. I'm in the heart of the action now. I'm not going to mourn my own death. The others will suffer. They'll still be here to grieve and miss me. Martin Luther King said, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrate it. After Kola's death, I couldn't even think about Yuri, much less grieve for him. I couldn't grieve for either of them, neither Kola nor Yuri. It's just too much, too painful, too incomprehensible. This time it was a European guy who died. That's why I'm here. I have no idea how many locals have been killed or thrown in prison. They're the ones who are really trying to change things. We're here to provide support the next time somebody brings a case. In Mexico, this thing is so big. It's a question of impunity and the culture of impunity. In Mexico, it seems like the perpetrators have a basic belief that you can do anything you want and nothing will ever be done about it. 
Statistics show that this goes on. Over 90% of all crimes committed go unsolved, including homicides. We have to look at this on two levels. First, examine the prosecutor's investigations. The investigations conducted in 2010 and 2014. The prosecutor's office should report on whether the criminal investigation has progressed and whether there have been any snags. The second thing is to point out that we signed a letter of intent two years ago between the regional and federal prosecutor's office. According to this, the prosecutor's office will assist in locating and arresting the suspects. What is the situation with the 14 suspects, with the arrest warrants? One was murdered, three are in prison, one was convicted of another murder. Three are in prison. One of them has a previous 12-year sentence for murder. Not for this, though. For this case. In this case, the trial hasn't begun. No, it hasn't. The prisoners have managed to get their trial pushed back. Two of them have changed attorneys. The charge is enough, but when going to trial, we'll run into other problems, such as witness protection. The charge is enough, as is, though. The deputy prosecutor's presence supposedly shows how seriously the case is being taken, but they've said the same thing in previous meetings. The Mexican government is committed to investigating the case. We demanded witness protection and they promised to consider it. The investigations haven't progressed. There are wonderful people here who are working for human rights and whose efforts I want to support. I want to see this through to honor Yuri's memory. This is my son, Omar Esparza, the widower of Betty Carino. He thinks if we fight this case together, there will also be justice for the Mexicans. 
myös meksikolaisilla on mahdollisuus saada oikeutta. Tämä oli tietysti kyllä ihan iloinen. This new arrest is good news. Pidätys, koska mun mielestä se on kuitenkin semmoinen niin keskushenkilöksi. Se on näitä I think he's a key figure among regional leaders. Se, kuka on, on vangi. Even though he looks like a peasant in the photo. He is one sorry looking fellow. Maybe because he got caught. It's a good thing. Pleased to meet you. My condolences on the loss of your husband. I would like to welcome you all, especially the mother and brother of Yiri Yakula. I'd also like to express my condolences on the death of your husband. This is the fourth time we are meeting with the governor. He has promised to cooperate in every meeting, including this one. We talked about the witness protection, which was also requested by the prosecutor's office, as was the governor's cooperation in the matter. But in actual fact, that protection has not been extended to our key witnesses. It's surprisingly easy to get pulled into this whole charade, to come here for a couple of weeks, put on some nice clothes and shake the hands of the people who are lying to you and telling you they're doing their best. You shake their hands and say, this is going well. Then some poor farmer gets arrested who earns as much in a year as your average Finnish worker spends on cigarettes in a year. He gets stuck in jail for two years, and we're still waiting to see if anything will get done. I have a really hard time calling this a judicial system. I don't know, it's a system, but where's the justice? When you lose someone you love, it hurts. No struggle is worth the loss of a human life. It's so hard. There are so many different emotions. I've read many different accounts of the events. I know how it all happened. Even though I know the whole story, it's still so tough. What was my child thinking? What did Yuri go through? What did he think and feel, if anything at all? We know he saw how Betty was hit first and how she bled. Some of the people in the car said that Yuri was taking Betty's head in his hands when he was shot. 
They also showed us pictures taken at the scene. They were horrifying. I've also seen photos on the internet. It was important for me to look at them, to see my child in the last pictures ever taken of him. This is a year old. There's Yuri in the picture. Because of what happened, we've become involved in the Trique conflict. On our trips to Mexico, we've met women and children at the Oaxaca market. Where is the justice for them? What will happen to them? Justice would be if they could return to their homes and their lives. But is that even possible anymore? The attackers live there now. I'm afraid that their situation will only get worse. It's sad to see things change. I wish everything could be like it was on the first trip. There was a sense of hope and possibility. Life goes on, but the things you had hoped to see progress aren't changing. I know memories fade, and I'm afraid of that. I fear Yuri will fade into oblivion. He doesn't exist anymore. It breaks my heart that we can't share and discuss things. It breaks my heart that there won't be any new memories to cherish, and that the ones I have will fade with time. Hello everyone, thank you for being here today. For the past six years, we've done everything to bring the perpetrators to justice. But it seems that this justice system has no intention of arresting or convicting those responsible for the murder of Betty Cariño and Yuri Yacola. Without further ado, I'll let Eva Yacola take over from here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all for coming here today. We've been promised a lot over the past six years. But we don't need words, we need actions. Nine of the suspects are still free. Neither the witnesses nor the survivors are being protected. Trials are being postponed over and over again. I want to remember Betty as I knew her for 16 years. She was always on the streets, organizing demonstrations, and fighting for justice and human rights. Our lives have been threatened. Last year, we were forced to leave the country. Contract killers hired by the paramilitary troops tried to force their way into my home, where I was with my family and children. We were forced to leave the country for a few months. But I didn't want to move away permanently. 
Mexico is my home. International pressure is our only ally. The involvement of international agencies makes the whole thing possible. Betty's husband Omar once said that without Yiri's death, the entire incident would have been entirely forgotten. There would have been no progress, no arrests, no judicial process if Yiri had not been in that convoy. A foreigner, a young Finnish man named Yuri, is the only reason that the case has come this far. Where did you learn to speak Spanish? In Finland, Spain, and on these trips to Mexico. So you studied the language in Finland? There is more than enough evidence, but no one has been convicted. Despite this, the authorities are not making any effort to bring the suspects to court. This is a question of the authorities avoiding making a decision on the matter. Sometimes I feel like I just want to be rid of it all, just walk away from the whole thing. Michel also wrote today that it's exhausting. How are we supposed to cope? It will carry on for years. El país internacional, por favor. Sí, gracias. ¿Cuánto vale? 10 pesos. 10 pesos. Ok, está bien. Gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego, que le vaya bien. This is a very well written article. It says that Yuri's father died of a heart attack, that his heart couldn't take anymore. On the one hand, there's this incredible contempt for life, and on the other, a love of life, the striving for a life worth living, something that is all too real for Mexicans, but inconceivable to us. Gracias, no. This is an enormously ambitious goal, to break even one part of this culture of impunity. But I think that's what we must do. It gives us hope, faith and strength. It could serve as an example. There would be this kind of precedent that there would be a punishment for the crime.
I don't see what more could be done on Yuri's behalf now. It's ideology and belief in a better world that keeps this going. Maybe another trial in Mexico will have a better outcome. Is it a good idea to head off and join a revolution somewhere when I might be shot for it? Or is there some other way to change the world which would be more effective and safer? Writing is cathartic, but when I'm done, I look over at the fireplace and Kola's not there. That's when I realize I'm alone. All alone with my thoughts of Mexico. While I walk with my dog, 